Uh, as we pick up in chapter 18 of Genesis, verse 18, chapter 18 and the previous chapter, 17, are all at this, in the same time span, all within probably 90 days of each other, all definitely within the same season. In fact, chapter 17 and 18, Abraham is 99 to 100, somewhere in there. We don't know if he's had his birth there yet or not. And Sarah is 89 to 90 years of age. They are living in Hebron. Hebron is 20 miles from the Red Sea. I mean, the Jordan Valley. Um, not the Dead Sea, not the Red Sea, but the Jordan Valley. Boy, that was bad. 20 miles from the uh, Jordan Valley. There is no Dead Sea yet. Not yet. And Abraham is a Bedouin. He is living in tents. And in fact, I've kind of sketched out some tents. I want you to think about this. Uh, these are tents that are really just long pieces of um, squared off rectangle material that's, that's usually uh, sheep hides, goat hides, and that type of stuff that have been sewn together. It's not like we have material that we have where it's a solid piece for our tents. No, these are goat hides that have been sewn together. If they make them waterproof, they usually take porpoise skins and sew them on top of the hides to make them uh, waterproof because porpoise skins are waterproof. And so these Bedouins are living out in these tents. Now we picture, and that's why the picture that I have, I wish I could show you, we picture when we think about Bedouins, we think about all these tents that are, are out on the desert in the sands, and literally and truthfully is whenever they uh, desired to move, um, picking up one of these tents and rolling it up and putting it on a camel, whatever, and carrying it around was a difficult chore to do. Not like the tents that we have today where we can load up five or six tents and put them in a packet and have a, have a 10 year old carry them all because they're made out of that lightweight material. No, these are heavy, heavy tents. They lived in these tents and Abraham lived in tents most of his life. We do not know about when he was in the Ur of Chaldees, whether he was in a uh, brick and mortar type uh, house uh, like... Um, the people are going to be living down in Sodom, by the way. They're going to be in, in, in uh, uh, fired brick homes where they've taken mud bricks and hardened them by cooking them in a fire. Abram is going to be, since the time he left Haran, he's going to be living in tents. He will live in tents all his, the rest of his life. Uh, Abram is 100 years old at this point in time, 99 to 100. He is going to live to be 175. So for 75 more years, he's going to live outside in tents. How many of y'all would like to live outside in tents? Uh, this morning in the 8 o'clock class, we have a, a lady in that class who actually grew up in Syria, and she was well acquainted with, still today, people are living in these tents like Bedouins. They have their animals tied outside. They, they are living in these tents. Everything is there. There's no electricity. Everything they carry with them, they cook. The whole thing is done around these tents. Uh, even some of our foreign dignitaries today, still live in tents. And as you remember, we had one several years ago that wanted to pitch his tent on the UN uh, um, uh, uh, grounds, uh, coming to America to pitch his tent on the UN grounds. And we were really not sure whether he was, because we didn't like him, or America didn't like him, whether we were going to let him come in and put his tent. He didn't stay in hotels. He didn't add anything to the economy of our the world not at all no they brought everything they needed they brought their tents they brought their food they brought everything with them and did nothing for the economy of the United States uh, when they came to the UN and we have lots of this going on we just don't think about it because we have to understand the poorest person in our United States is usually wealthier by far than the rest of the people around the world because they live and are very, very poor. Now, yes, we have the multi-million and billionaires who control the oil industry and other things like that, but it doesn't get down to the majority of the people. So Abram Ham is just like this in that he is a Bedouin. He is a sojourner. He is everywhere he travels. He is traveling uh, in a, in, with his tents, with his people. And, and when you think about this, I drew three tents, but you have to remember 
Abraham had a house. The house, we're not talking about house, we're talking about under his household, but they're all living in tents. Had 318 fighting men 20 years and older, so this is going to be quite a sea of tents. Uh, when you add the moms and the dads and the wives and the kiddos and all that, there's quite a number of a sea of, sea of tent. And one other thing that we're going to find out as we go through, Abraham had his tent and Sarah had her tent. And it was quite common to have separate tents for the husband and separate tents for the wife and that things. And the kids would be all in one place. And it's just interesting some of the customs and the dynamics that were going on. We pick up in verse 1 of chapter 18. It says, Now the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. First of all, who is Mamre? Mamre was a Canaanite friend of of Abraham, who is allowing him to, for in his whole clan, Abraham's clan, to pitch their tents there in the Oaks of Mamre. The Oaks of Mamre was a little cluster of oak trees that Mamre owned. So, we think about uh, these tents being out in the desert, and surely they probably would have been had Mamre not allowed them to put their tents in his little forest of oak trees. Well, when you move from out in the desert area into oak trees, I don't know how many of y'all recognize this, but it becomes very clear to me because of all the camping that I have done in my life that when you have to realize where they, where they are in Hebron, they have storms, they have rains, they have high winds, uh, they have uh, 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 cold times, they have warm times, just like we do. And if you have your tent pitched out on a sand dune someplace, when a storm comes along and you're in it, all you can do is just let it fall on you and just ride it out and then hope you can dig yourself out when the sands have stopped blowing across it. But when you move into a forest area where there are trees, now you can string ropes between the trees. Now you can hang your, your uh, tent cover over these and tie them in a different way to where let the storms come, let them be the, what they are, that you're probably going to survive inside of a little forest area because you've got the strength of the trees holding your tents in place. More than that, you also have the shade of the oak trees that are cutting the heat that's hitting the tent, so it's a more pleasant place to live underneath the tents. The only thing you have to worry about is when the oak has its little acorns and you have those acorns start hitting the top of your tent and you think, th keep thinking, oh my, oh my, oh my. You can't sleep at night because the wind's blowing and the acorns are hitting the tents. I know about those type of things because um, we have oak trees and you know, I live in Bay Oaks. Therefore, we have oaks. And certain times of the years, you hear those oaks when the wind, the winter is blowing, the oak, the little oak acorn things are hitting your windows and hitting everything. And, and then the problem is, is you have to get up there and you have to clean the gutters out. Now, you haven't lived until you've cleaned gutters out filled with oak, the little oak acorns and stuff like that. And I've kind of learned if you just leave them there, the squirrels kind of think it's a, it's a storage bin, so they just eat them as they need them at that point in time. Well, that's right, lots of squirrels. Well, wherever Abram lived, he lived in the sea of tents because of all the people. And he lived there in the oaks of Mamre, and it was a good place for him to be. And he was sitting at the door of the tent whenever the Lord approached him, and he was there in the heat of the day. The heat of the day starts about 11 o'clock in the morning. It goes through till about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, the earth has warmed up. The sun is coming up. The sun's not at high noon yet. It's about an hour going into high noon. And finally, about 11 o'clock, things are, are really hot, really hot. And so Abraham is in his tent here at, in, the, in the heat of the day when this happens. Verse 2. And he lifted up his eyes... And looked and beheld three men were standing opposite him. It doesn't say he saw them walking up. He just saw them standing there. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. You see, this is not somebody he didn't know. Because... 
in last week's lesson, last chapter, he's already had many interactions with this Lord. He knows who he is. He is the almighty God of all creation. And this same Lord in last week's chapter said to Abram, Listen, Abram, your name is Abram and, and we're going to change your name to Abraham. And we're going to change Sarah's name to uh, Sarai's name to Sarah. And, and by the way, we're going to make a covenant together. But I want to tell you something before we do that covenant. Uh, you're, you're going to have a son. Oh, yes, Ishmael. No, no, not Ishmael. You're going to have a son through Sarah. And, and you're going to name him Isaac. And that has happened. But the promise whenever the Lord left him last week in that situation was that in this same season next year, she's going to have this child. Well, the Lord has left, and now the ceremony of the circumcision ceremony of everybody in Abraham's tribe and family has, has taken place. And now the Lord has come back to see Abraham again. And, the Lord, and Abraham sees him, and he recognizes him. Verse 4 says, Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may go on since you have visited your servant. Uh, Abram's thinking, he's just coming by just to check on me. And by the way, while he's here, I want to get him a piece of bread. I don't want to wash his feet. I want to take care of him. I got some real questions about that, but I'll ask that in a minute. And they said to him, do so as you have said. So Abram hurried to the tent of Sarah, the tent of Sarah. He didn't hurry to his tent that he was sitting in. He hurries to Sarah's tent. You catch that? And he said, quickly, prepare, prepare three measures of fine flour, knead it, and make baked cakes. Okay. How long does it take? I'm just asking questions. Just can't. How long does it take to stir up some flour? Not long to stir up some flour. Not, not long to knead it and all that. Kind of, but make a fire. Bake some bread, an hour, unless you don't let it rise, but an hour if you don't, and if you do, a little while longer than that, okay. Verse 7, Abraham also ran to the herd, and he took a tender and choice calf and gave it to the servant, and he hurried to prepare it. Okay, so now that's going to take a little while longer to prepare than the bread would take, Okay. And he took curds and milk and the calf which had been prepared and placed it before them. And he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. Standing by them as they ate. That is not a normal place to eat. Uh, standing is not the normal way that they did it. Back in those days, they said that they were going to prepare the table, but it wasn't a, a table. It wasn't a table like if you go to a restaurant or at your house and you set everything and everybody pulls up chairs. For them, a table was a small piece of carpet or a tapestry that was laid on the ground, something they could beat out to keep it clean. They'd lay it out, they put the food on it, and, every, and the men would lounge around that piece of carpet or sit cross-legged. And they would eat with their hands. They had no utensils. They would eat with their hands. They'd pass it around. But they would do it on the ground. They're not eating on the ground. They are standing as they're eating. My question, I have lots of questions about this. I wish I'd have been there. I would have loved to have seen, just to answer some of my spiritual questions. Number one. What was the Lord and the two assistants, which were two angels, by the way. We'll find that out next chapter. What were they doing while everything was being prepared? Were they going from tent to tent saying, hello, how are you? What are you doing? Can we help you with anything? Can we blow something up? Can we heal anything? No, they're not doing that. Uh, probably they're standing under the oak tree like this. Just standing there. Nothing's bothering them. They're just standing there. Do you remember that angels are spirit beings? And they have been around since the day they were created on the first day of creation. So waiting four or five hours standing up is probably not going to bother them, even though they're older than Methuselah. 
not going to bother them. They've been around for a long time, and they're just doing what they need to do. They're just standing there waiting. Then I've got some real questions. Abram's fixing bread, meat, milk, and curds for the Lord and two angels. Do angels eat food? And if they do eat food, what do they do with the food after they have eaten it? And if they've washed their feet, where did they get feet to wash? Are these angels just looking like they're humans? Do they look different? Do they need food? Are they just being polite? What's going on? Y'all write those questions down, and some of y'all that get to heaven before I do, send the answers back when you find out. Hey, ask one more question. Ask one more. What's that? Does it mean he looked upon the face of the Lord? Well, that's a question we already answered two weeks ago, and the answer is yes. Abraham has seen the face of the Lord because he can look upon the face of the Lord. Yes, don't you know that when the Lord came to earth, people looked upon his face? The person you cannot look upon his face is God the Almighty. God the Father, and live. God? Okay. So, this meal is prepared, and lo and behold, I don't know the answers to those questions. All I know is, it took a little while for that meal to be prepared, and those angels and the Lord stood under the oak tree and waited, and then they ate with Abraham there, uh, and Abraham watched. Yes, ma'am, Mary. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't the quail from heaven, but it was manna from heaven. Then they said, that's food of the angels. And what does that mean? Have we got any idea? No, but we'll all know one day. Verse 9 says, Then they said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will surely return to you at this time next year. Oh, the last time it was this time this, next, this season. But now it's going to be this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the door, which was behind him. Okay, fix this up. They're standing under an oak tree. Abram is, Ham is standing there with the angels. The Lord asks, where is Sarah? Sarah is in her tent that is behind Abraham. Right there. He Sarah is listening to what is being said. And now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. And Sarah was past childbearing. Sarah's going to laugh. You know that. That's coming up. Here it is. And Sarah laughed to herself saying, After I have become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Meaning, Abram, you're ten years older than I am. You're ancient. I'm going to have a child. You're going to have a child. Can this be? <laughs> she laughs. And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am old? And look at the word. I love the next thing he says. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? And at the appointed time, I will return to you. There it is again. At this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. It's a repeat. And Sarah denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, nope, but you did laugh. Can you imagine? Sarah's back there. She's 90 years old, 89 to 90 years old. She has seen all these women through 90 years about uh, give birth to children and the joy and the pleasure that that is is for a woman to have a child, to hold a child, to nurse a child, to raise a child. What pleasure that is. It is, beyond, it is one of the greatest things that women ever do, is to have and bear children and to raise them. It is just, 
unimaginable to men of what that is like, even though we play the other part as men. I understand that. But we never understand what a woman thinks. I'm often amazed, and I say this quite often, you know, uh, you send boys and girls off to college, and they are wilder than wild can be. And lo and behold, they come out of college, and they've learned a bunch of stuff they shouldn't have learned at college. And then they finally, they, uh, they get married. A uh, boy and a girl gets married, and um, they're still kind of running wild. And then lo and behold, and this is not always the case, but in, in general, but not always. And then lo and behold, the, the wife, the young wife, becomes pregnant. And she's still kind of running a little wild, but something happens when that little critter comes out. Something happens to the brain of a woman when that little critter comes out. She turns almost across the board. Those mothers, young mothers, turn from being teenage thinking girls at 21, 22, whatever the age is, to fully mature women who have their head square on their shoulder. Just boom, overnight. All the idea of the responsibility that they have with this child just sets in. While the husband is still thinking, hey, you know, we can still keep doing what we've been doing. Oh, yeah, little critter came along. We'll call him critter. Little critters come along and we just, you know, we can keep running. We can keep running the streets and doing things we're doing. And the wife's going, no, we can't do this. No, we can't do that. we got a child. And then almost unanimously across the board in the United States, you have your first child and y'all have never gone to church in your life. And what does the wife say to the husband? You know, we got a child. We got to take Critter. Critter needs to be in church. I've never went to church. Well, we need to find a church because Critter needs to be in a church. You see the thinking that happens? It's almost universal in women. It is. Men don't think that way. It takes men another five or six or seven years to realize that they need to grow up and stop doing the childish things. Why? I don't know. But I think it has something to do with mother. Sarah's laughing. She's seen all that. And she's almost laughing like a teenager saying, oh, that can't happen. Me, can you think me at my age? I'm 89, 90 years old, and my husband's 10 years old. You think we can have a child? What will we do to have a child? Who's going to bounce that little child up on our knees? I can't even get up on the stool. I hardly all, you know, carrying around. You th- I'm trying to get on a camel. I can't even climb up the little th- thing to get on the camel. And you think I'm going to have a child? Okay. And you- <laughs> Thank you, Mother Mary. All right. And the Lord says, Sarah, no, but you did laugh. She's caught. She's caught. And Sarah laughed to herself saying, oh, I've already read that. You did laugh. Let's go on. Verse 16. I shouldn't have tore my lesson apart. Then the men rose up from there and looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to send them off. Before we go on, I want you to look at that map. You have it there. I also have the map up here. I showed it to you a minute ago. They're up on a, on a mountain ridge. Hebron is actually up on a mountain ridge that can look over towards the Jordan River Valley. And you can see the indent in the dip. And there was much more landscape there before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah than there is today. It's about 20 miles to go straight across from Hebron straight across to the uh, Jordan River Valley. On your map, it actually has the Dead Sea there, but that Dead Sea is not there yet. The um, area of the Dead Sea that holds all that water uh, will not be formed until the next day after today's lesson that we have today, okay? Tomorrow, in other words, in chapter 19, the next day, 
They're talking, the Lord is talking with Abraham today, and all the destruction that's going to cause the Dead Sea is going to happen starting at noon tomorrow, in other words. You understand that? And then that Dead Sea, the water coming down from the Jordan River is going to be able to fill that area uh, with, uh, that will become the Dead Sea. It's about 20 miles over there. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. For I have chosen him in order that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. In order that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. Should I tell Abraham what I'm about to do? He's asking to the two angels that are with him. Should I tell him? Verse 20 says this, And the Lord said, He's talking to Abraham, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. Now I've looked at this in every way, form, or fashion. Every way, form, or fashion. It says their sin. It doesn't say their sins. The original doesn't say sins. In fact, the original leads us to the conclusion that something, one thing that they are doing in those villages is so grievously bad that the Lord is going to bring judgment upon those cities. Now folks, sin is sin is sin is sin is sin. And the Lord has already laid out for us in the first 17 chapters different things that are sins. So He's laying out the things that He approves of and the things that He disapproves of. But He's not laid out for us any idea of what this sin is that is so exceedingly grave that he is not going to allow it to continue. Oh, there was multitudes of sins that led to the flood that killed everyone except for Noah, his wife, his three sons, and three daughter-in-laws. Lots of sins were bad. So maybe, just maybe... Because Shem is still alive when this is going on. Shem rode on the ark. He is still alive at this point in time. Shem's son is still alive. In fact, several of his sons are still alive. And they're back in the homeland. In fact, Shem is not going to die until 10 years or so before Abraham dies. Abraham is going to live 75 more years. So we possibly still have some teaching that we don't have in the Bible that Abraham knows or has been portrayed down through the people of the Lord who are still trusting in the Lord, that they know some of the reasons why the flood had to occur because of the, the uh, disdain that the Lord had for the sins that were going on. But here we have one sin. It's not two sins. It's not three sins. It's not four sins. It's not a whole pile of sins. You know, if we went around in this room today, uh, every one of us could, could, could mention some sin that we have, and, and there's enough in, in, of us in here that probably there's enough, we, we won't even mention all the possible sins that we have okay, that are in the world. If you remember when I was teaching one of those uh, uh, studies, I listed for you half of the sins that I had identified in the Scripture, and there was 500 half. There were actually more than a thousand. But instead of taking up paper time, I just put 500 of them in there. And I said in the list, see if one of these is your sin, and if it is, you're a sinner. Because it only takes one. Got it? So we could go through, and y'all could mention, and some of y'all should be the same, but maybe a little different attitude about it, or whatever, different direction. This is one sin. This is one sin that these towns have in common among the people. I guarantee you they had other sins. But it's only one sin of these sins that matters to the Lord. And he says, I will go down now 
and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me, and if not, I will know. I got news for you what the Lord's basically saying here to Abraham is. The outcry of this sin is in my knowledge. The Lord is all-seeing, He's all-knowing, He's all-hearing, He is all-powerful. He's all, He's all, He's all, He's all, He's all. He's got these nine major attributes about Him. He knows everything. And He's telling Abraham that I'm going to go down there. I have heard about this. I know about it. I've seen it. It's what's happening. And when we get there, if it's going on, I'm going to destroy the cities. I'm going to destroy the villages because of this sin that is occurring. Verse 22 says, Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, while Abraham and was still standing before the Lord. The Lord doesn't go down there, by the way. Nope, not going to go down there. Because Abraham is going to enter into a negotiation with the Lord. Negotiating with the Lord. I wonder if that's a smart thing to do. Negotiate with the Lord. Trying to work things around so that something that the Lord says is a sin that you are doing or some family member is doing, mm, there might be a way to work around the gray edges and the loopholes and get you out of that sin. Get you out of that condemnation that's coming your way. To reason with the Lord. You read in the Bible, it says something very plain and uh, plain, and you just you pick up and you look up and you say, "Well, that applies to everybody else, but that's not going to apply to me." The two angels are headed on down to Sodom. The two uh, uh, the two assistants to the Lord. Now I want to remind you, Sodom is twenty miles from Hebron. We are late in the afternoon. Late in the afternoon. They show up in the heat of the day, 11, 12, somewhere along in there. Takes a little while, maybe three, four hours, whatever. Get the meal together. They eat the meal. They talk. They walk towards the edge where they can look down and see Sodom, the valley of the Jordan River over in the distance. The two angels keep going on. Uh, by the way, it's 20 miles away. I, I said that, right? I did. And, of course, we know that a 20-mile journey for a human being takes all day. They start early in the morning after they've had breakfast. They walk about 10 miles. They stop. They make a small camp. They cook their meal for the, a meal for the day. They rest in the holiday for a little bit and then they go on 10 miles more. And when they get 10 miles more, they stop. They make camp for the night. About 20 miles a day is all they can make. It's already afternoon and we're going to speed ahead in what I'm going to tell you. These two angels get to Sodom before the sun goes down. These angels are moving like that. Okay? There's no way they could have just walked 20 miles and gotten there before the sun went down. There's no way they could have gotten there before the gates of the city would have been closed for everyone to be in for security of the night because everybody was still at the gates and Lot was still at the gates sitting when they saw them walking up. They got there. They looked like they moved there slow, but they moved there fast. So what happens then, after they get there, verse 23 says, And Abram came near and said, he's talking to the Lord, Wilt thou indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Listen, he, he's, he's thinking just like man thinks. All of us think. Sup suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Wilt thou indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous who are in it? Now think about that. Oh, God's a good God. He won't allow righteous people to be destroyed while he's trying to still get bad people out of the way. No, no, no. He, he, God wouldn't do that. God would destroy people who are innocent bystanders. 
who love the Lord with all their heart. They lean not on their own understanding. Would God allow His destruction upon those who are wicked to also bring the collateral damage of those who love Him and trust Him beyond all measure? Would God kill a righteous person? Paul kind of answers that for us. Just before he was going to be beheaded, he says, To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And whether I live, I live for Christ. And whether I die, I die for Christ. Who's Christ? It's the Lord we're talking about here. And the answer to that question is, yes. The Lord will allow the righteous to in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, lose their physical life here on earth to have eternal life with Him in heaven. He will. So... Abraham continues to negotiate with God. He goes on to try to shame the Lord. You got it? Verse 25. Far be it from thee to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? The Lord set up the system of how it works. Abraham doesn't like the system, and I don't like the system either. I don't like the system that one day all of us are going to have to pass to go to heaven through the portal of death. It's just the way the Lord set the system up. And we're going to enter in that. Why does the Lord take out me, who's righteous? I know some of y'all might think different, but the righteous. So that I have to stop teaching here on earth of God's blessing so that I can go on to be with the Lord in some place that I know a whole lot about, but I'm not sure about to get in there. Okay? I know, I know, I know that when it's time for me to cross the chilly Jordan and go into heaven, it's going to be on dry ground and it's not going to be chilly for me, but it sure is chilly for the rest of us who are, who, are, who are left behind. I've got my bags packed. I am ready to go. But why me, oh Lord, when I'm doing such a good job for you? I'll ask that same question for Adrian Rogers. Why did the Lord have to take Adrian Rogers? Why did he have to take W.A. Criswell? Why, I mean, I can name names. Why did he have to take L.D. Morgan? Why? When they were doing such good jobs for you? Because it's part of God's plan. It's part of God's plan. Oh, Abram says, surely you wouldn't do that. And so the Lord said, All right, Abraham. If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare the whole place on their account. On their account. Got that? On their account. If I find 50, I'll spare the whole kitten caboodle. All of them. Everybody be spared. Now Abraham <clears throat> realizes that he's in a pickle. Because he's adding on his fingers how many think, people that he think is is righteous over there in the city. And 50 may be a few too many. Because he already knows what's going on over there. And so he says this. So the Lord said. Now behold. I'm sorry. Verse 27. Now behold. I have ventured to speak to the Lord. Although I am but dust and ashes. You know I'm just mortal. I'm human. Suppose 50 righteous are lacking five. Wilt thou destroy the city because of five? Abraham was a smart man. I don't think he was over there counting on his fingers. He says, but what happens if it lacks five? And the Lord goes on to say, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. The Lord can add. 50 minus five is 45. And he spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose forty are found there. And he said, I will not do it on account of the forty. And he said, Oh, may the Lord not be angry. And 
Shall I speak? Suppose 30 are found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, Now, behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord. Suppose only 20, I added the word only, 20 are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of 20. And then he said, Oh, may the Lord not be angry. And shall I speak only this once? I'm just going to talk once more. As if he hadn't already been talking and figuring. Suppose ten are found there. And the Lord said, I will not destroy it on account of the ten. And as soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed. And Abraham returned to his place. Now I'm going to tell you what I think Abram was thinking. He has negotiated down to ten. He probably should have negotiated even further. In fact, I believe that Abraham has made a calculated mistake. Here's the reason why. Abram knows, Abraham knows that Lot is over there. And Lot's wife, Salty, is over there. <laughs> For those of you who hadn't caught that joke, you'll get it next time in chapter 19. And Lot and his wife have two daughters living in the house with them. But in chapter 19, we're going to find out that Lot also has other daughters that are married. So the angels are going to say to Lot, we are going to destroy this place. Do you have any other family, and they mean blood family, in town? Lot is going to answer affirmative And the angels are going to send Lot outside the doors, outside the door of his house, in the night, when it's not safe to be outside in that terrible, corrupt, and sinful town. And he's going to go out, and he's going to go to the houses of his daughters and his sons-in-law. It's plural. Well, that means there's at least two. You got that? It's not daughter and sons, one. It's daughters and sons-in-law. That means there's at least two daughters out there. And they have husbands. And what's going to happen in chapter 19, the husbands are going to think that Lot is joking with them and they are not going to return to the house of Lot to be protected by the angels. So we've got four in the house, maybe two daughters and two sons-in-laws. That's four more. And maybe there's some kids... Maybe there's some kids. Maybe there's a third daughter with a son-in-law. That's six. I believe that Abraham has calculated how many relatives, blood relatives of Lot are over in Sodom. And he is believing that the ten are there. And because of that, because the Lord, he knows is now, by now, is that the Lord's departing and the Lord's not going to Sodom. The angels are already at Sodom, are headed that way that he's got it covered, that Sodom and Gomorrah, Admom, and Zebuim are going to be safe cities because ten righteous are going to be found there. Ten righteous. Well, we know because we know the rest of the story, Abraham was wrong. There wasn't even ten. And the Lord who knows everything did not even go to the city Because his two angels were there. And they are fixing to, in chapter 19, be the targets of the one sinful issue that is exceedingly grievous to the Lord. Exceedingly grave, the text says. It is burdensome to the Lord. It is heavy to the Lord. And we will see what that sin is. When we join together in chapter 19 next time. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time to study your word. In your name, amen and amen.